Welcome to Harbour Church. My name is Rob Sharp and I'm the pastor of Harbour Church. It's so great that you're with us, whether you're already part of our community or you've recently connected with us through our online services. It'd be fantastic to hear from you. So get in touch by emailing or on Facebook. Our church's vision is to be a life changing community for Christ. So we're going to be praising God and praying to Him. We'll meet the living God through His Word to us and our lives will be changed. Harbour Church is a community for all ages. So make sure you connect with our Harbour Kids and Harbour Youth Ministries. The details are on our website. Let's begin our service by praising our awesome God together with a song. nice to be with you. We're going to be singing a new song this morning. It's called Who You Say I Am. Amber and I are going to sing the verse and the chorus first. And so have a listen to it and then we'll invite you to sing along.
That song reminds me of a quote by J.I. Packer. He says, I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. And every day is one day closer. My saviour is my brother. And every Christian is my brother or sister too. What a great idea. It's that God, our heavenly father, that we are meeting with today, this morning, and we are going to exalt him, give him the highest place in our lives and our highest praise, which is what we're called to do in Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Well, this morning uh, we are going to exalt this great God in everything. Uh, through our sermon series, Respectable Sins, we're going to be looking at pride and selfishness. And then later on, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So it's a great service that we're going to be taking part in today. Let me pray. We exalt you, our God, the King, King of creation, King of your church and King of heaven. As we look to the cross of Christ, we see that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. You have made us your children so we can praise you every day and for eternity. We cannot get to the very depths of your greatness, but today we pray. Draw us deeper to you so that we can see more of your glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, it's time for some church news now. Uh, and firstly, if you're newish to Harbour Church, particularly online, we'd love to connect with you. Go to our website. You'll see how you can connect there. And we would love to get in touch with you. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I should explain why I'm wearing a beanie. Uh, today is Beanie Sunday, and so watch this clip uh, to hear about it. This Sunday is Beanie Sunday. So get your beanies, get your gloves, your scarves, your blankets, maybe even your dog to keep warm. And uh, let's partner with Anglicare. Winter is a tough time for some people whether it's covering rent or high electricity bills, getting warm clothes and putting food on the table, covering all that can be impossible for some people. COVID-19 has only made things harder for them who are already struggling and has also put many people into jeopardy for the first time. Jesus, he gave himself for us when we were poor so that we could be rich through him. And that's why we can and should be generous uh, to those in need. Anglicare does a fantastic job caring for people both physically, uh, mentally and, and spiritually. And so it's really helpful for us to partner with them. We're doing it differently this year because we're not able to do it in church. But if you're able to give, I want to encourage you to go to the Anglicare website and make a donation. You'll see an option there to donate $24 uh, as the winter appeal to a family to, to provide them with essential groceries. Or for $31, you can buy books and school supplies for children living in poverty. You can make your donation uh, at any, for any amount as well. Uh, if you don't want to donate through them, you can do it through Harbour Church. Just use the code ANGLICARE and we'll be able to pass that on. This Beanie Sunday, let's give thanks to God for his provision to us in so many ways and be used by him uh, to care for those in need. Okay, well, tonight is Sunday Night Live at five o'clock. Uh, if you've been missing that live experience of church, well, we get a taste of that with Sunday Night Live as we meet on Zoom. I'll be giving an update about getting back to church. Uh, we'll be hearing about Harbour Church ministries, finances, our mission partners, and just how people are going. Uh, so look forward to seeing you at Sunday Night Live. 
Next we've got our kids spot. And so we're going to watch the last of our following Jesus videos. I'm going to hear the big question from Harbour Kids and the shout out from Harbour Youth. What will we arrest him for? We'll find something. <laughs> oh. I heard him say he was going to kill the Emperor. He uses dark magic to win over Simpleton. He said he would tear down God's temple and build it again in three days. Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? Tell us, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Yes, I am. Soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right side of God, all-powerful, and coming on the clouds of heaven. <laughs> This man claims to be God. We don't need any more witnesses. You've heard what he said. What do you think? He is guilty and deserves to die. It can't be. It can't be. You, you're a friend of his, aren't you? You were with him. I don't know what you mean. But you were. This man was with Jesus. I don't even know the man. You are one of them. You can tell by your accent. I'm not lying. I don't know him. My God! My God! Why have you deserted me? Sinners, you are all welcome. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord! <laughs> Follow me, and from now on you will bring in people instead of fish. This message has been brought to you by Harbour Kids. Big question. Why did Jesus tell parables? Jesus told parables to teach people about God and his kingdom. Hello everyone, uh, we're here at Harbour Youth on Zoom uh, and we're celebrating Beanie Friday uh, with all of our awesome beanies that you can see uh, we're, keeping, we're keeping warm. Uh, so everyone just say a quick hello and you can show off your quick Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm on TV. <laughs> Look, Zoe, I'm on TV. 
Look, Nate, I'm on TV. <laughs> Look, Matt, I'm on TV. Awesome. No, if you want to join us for Harvey Youth, we're still meeting uh, at 7 o'clock for the rest of the term. Bye, Bye Wayne. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Merry Christmas. Morning, everyone. My name's Bram. Uh, I'm going to be leading us in prayer this morning as we talk to our awesome God. Uh, in particular, today we're going to be praying for the Queen's birthday public holiday, long weekend, uh, for Harbour Church Finances, for the Christianity Explored series, and for Chris and Karen Webb and their ministry in Broome in Western Australia. Uh, but before uh, we do, I'm going to read for us from Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will not be shaken. Let's continue to pray to God now together. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for rest, uh, for time uh, down that allows us to spend time with loved ones, uh, family, friends, and spend time with you as well. We pray for the Queen's public holiday uh, long weekend, that we'll be able to enjoy downtime uh, with friends after many difficult months. Uh, and we pray that in the face of the temptation to bend the rules uh, that the government has put in place regarding gatherings, uh, that you'll help us, your people, to do what is right and honours you. And we pray for safety this weekend as well for people travelling um, and enjoying time away. We pray also, God, for the finances here at Harbour Church. Uh, we thank you for answering our prayers in the way that our financial position has improved this year. Please help us to continue to give wisely and generously to support the life-changing ministries uh, that can only take place because of our partnership with one another at Harbour Church. We pray for Sunday Night Live tonight, uh, that, we're, that it'll be encouraging and informative as we hear about the latest situation of our church. And we pray that you will continue to sustain us as members of Harbour Church and of the body of Christ as we continue to meet online and gather in small groups to watch the services in each other's homes. We pray also, God, for those who don't know you uh, and those that are investigating the Bible's claims about who Jesus is and what he means for our lives. So we ask that uh, for those who have only newly joined with us at Harbour Church through our online series, that they'll be able to get on board with the Christianity Explored series and investigate for themselves what being a follower of Jesus is all about and means for their life. And we pray that your spirit will be working in their hearts to see their need for Jesus and their need for forgiveness. And finally, Lord, we bring before you the Webs, our mission partners in Broome, Thank you for the work that they are doing uh, and the work that you are doing through them uh, to make the gospel known in Broome. Please continue to sustain their ministry, especially during this time when services and events can't run as normal and when there are new financial strains uh, on the way that their work is supported. We pray that you will provide many opportunities for them to continue sharing Jesus. Please comfort them when they feel isolated and remind them of your love and care for them as they continue to do the ministry with the local community. We pray all of these things, God, in the name of Jesus, your son, uh, who brings us back into relationship with you. Amen. Good morning, Harbour Church. My name is Debbie. It's my pleasure to read the Bible for us this morning. But let's pray together before we do that. Gracious Father, we do thank you for your word, for the way you have revealed yourself to us through it, for the freedom we have to own it, to read it and to study it. Father, we ask this morning, as we do that, you would open our minds to what you have to say to us and open our hearts to receive it, that we might live a life worthy of our calling in you. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So our first reading this morning 
is coming from Philippians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 1 through to verse 12. Philippians 1, Philippians 2, verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now we're moving back to Romans. Chapter 12, and there we're reading from verse 1 through to verse 10. Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophecy, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouragement, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Life's all about me. I should be at the centre of, of everything and everyone. I should be at the centre of your life. That's what our culture tells us. Uh, sure, through the media and, and everything like that, we, we know that, but it's, it's actually part of our everyday life as well. The self-serve at the shopping centres now, at the supermarkets, because, well, I, I'm too important to wait for you to get your groceries. Or what about TV streaming? I, hey, I love it. But it's really because I can't, it's got to wait. Uh, certainly can't wait to a week for the next episode, but I want to be able to do it, watch when I want, how I want, what I want. Even Macca's has had to cave. Uh, in the past, you'd have to come in and just get whatever was on the board. Well, now, no, 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 I, I need my burger. And so I come in and I tap it and I create my own because it's all about me. Which what, it, and that's what makes God's call to us today so radically counter-cultural. Anyone who says being a Christian is boring doesn't quite get it. No, it's radically counter-cultural. 
Today we're going to be thinking about pride and selfishness. And I want to say straight up, I, I sin in this way. I struggle with it. But also, as we've been saying, that each week as we look at our respectable sins, it's not a guilt trip, but a, a reminder to live out the gospel, to, to let it come alive in every part of our life. I know at times, just in life, but certainly as we work through this series, you might be feeling, oh man, this is a burden. I'm facing difficulties in life or, or even just being a Christian is challenging enough and and now I've got to do this. I'm just trying to keep my head above water. Or why, why can't we just be happy and focus on happy thoughts? The other night when I was down at Woolies just before dinner, uh, I pulled into the car park and, and the guy next to me, he locked his keys in his car. And so I offered to give him a hand and, and he's there and he's trying to get in. And all he's got is this coat hanger bent out of shape to try and shift the, the lock on the door to get in. And as I sort of drove away, because I couldn't help him in the end, and I'd done my shopping, drove away, I was thinking, I think sometimes we can feel like that with our Christian life. I've got to fix my sin in order to be able to get in with God. We can feel that when we're confronting our respectable sins. But the truth is, the gospel means that we actually are already in with God through Jesus. Having our faith in Him is like the key that gets us in. We don't have to do anything, but once we're in there, once we're living this relationship and life with God, we want to go His way. And that's why we're confronting our respectable sins. If you like, each week and, and today as we look at pride and selfishness, it's like the ripple strip on the side of the road or those signs saying wrong way, turn back, because when we turn and, and pursue pride or selfishness in this case, we're going away from the, the life to the full that Jesus won for us on the cross and wants to give us now and for eternity. Pride and selfishness, they are two of probably the easiest sins to spot in others, and, and we can often be good at that but also probably one of the hardest to expose in ourselves. So let's pray uh, and ask God to help us. Almighty God, you know each one of us. You know our circumstances, the plans and the priorities that we have. And so we ask today, confront in us our pride and selfishness and give us Humble hearts and minds like Jesus, who humbly and selflessly went to the cross for us. Amen. Well, first of all, let's look at pride. Uh, and if we were to define it and, and kind of explain, well, why is that a sin? It would be this. It's to put yourself above others and even above God. It's to make yourself the God of your life. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve were doing in the garden it wasn't just that the fruit looked delicious, it was, here's a way to, to take the place of God. That's pride. But pride isn't always a bad thing, even in the Bible. So a good sense of pride is when we appreciate achievement or accomplishment, whether that be ours or others. Now, it's not meant to elevate us, we're just taking satisfaction in what is accomplished. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 30, says, Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We can take pride in, in Jesus. He even says about the Corinthians of all churches, he has pride in them. But what we're talking about today is the sin of pride. And look, this is addressed in Philippians chapter 2. What an incredible passage that we had read to us. And after talking about the unity we have with Jesus, Paul then says in verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. There's pride. It's, it's thinking that we are better than others, that we are the most important, number one person. 
Humility is the exact opposite. It's the reverse. It's thinking others are better. Thinking about others' needs before our own. And that's, that's radical stuff. And the reason that we are to do that comes to us in verse 5. We are to have the, the attitude or the mindset like Jesus. An incredible passage that reminds us that Jesus became like a servant. The Son of God humbled himself even to death. And so what we have here in Jesus is not only an example, an incredible one, but also we see that he is the one who empowers us for humility instead of pride because we are united with him. And so what I want to do this morning is just briefly to address two aspects of pride that we often tolerate. They're our respectable sins in this way. And the first one is moral self-righteousness. What's that? Well, the uh, best way to do it is to look at the picture or the, the person of the Pharisee that Jesus uh, told us the story about in, in Luke 18. He comes into the temple and we're told, The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Uh, here's the Pharisee, the the super religious guy, the self-righteous guy. And, and let's be honest, he want, it makes us want to vomit. It's so bad how proud he is of himself and kind of thinks God should be. But he's not alone. We do the same thing when we look down on other people around us, particularly outside in our society. Uh, religious people are bandits for this. Because we think we're so much better. I take for example, you go to the shops and there's a family there and the, the parents are swearing at the kids because the kids are just going feral. Now that's, that's tragic, but it doesn't make us superior. Now when we start looking down on them, that's the sin of pride, a moral self-righteousness. Instead we're to seek humility. That old saying, there but for the grace of God go I, is capturing the gospel. And that's, that's what we need to remind ourselves, that before the cross of Christ, we're all equal. We all deserved that punishment. None of us are worthy of him. We have nothing to take pride in for our salvation. Instead, as we remember God's grace, we can thank him for the gift of faith in Jesus and the gift of his grace to help us to repent, to turn back to him. Well, the other area of our sinful pride is the area of achievement. You know, our society is pretty obsessed with self-confidence and self-love. And the problem with it is it's, it's finding those things in us. And not in God. You see, despite what our world says, there is no such thing as the self-made man or woman. Because everything comes from God. There's nothing that you or I can point to and say, I did that all by myself, without anyone else, without God. No, our brains, our talent, our opportunities, all we have comes from Him. And so we shouldn't have pride in our achievements when we don't think about God. I often listen uh, to speeches, whether by somebody about themselves or maybe somebody about, them, uh, about another person, like a parent at a party or a wedding or something like that. Is it going to be about the achievements of this person or God? Are we going to hear thanks for, to God for who this person is and, and what they've been able to accomplish? Or is it just all about them? Sadly, we can also see the pride of achievement in ministry. When it comes, of, comes down to being recognized or given status for the things that we do. It's so important within churches that everyone is encouraged and appreciated. 
We need to work hard at that. But what we're talking about here is when that recognition of our achievement is, is recognized. It's, and if it doesn't, well, then we demand it or we quit and leave. That's sin. From Jesus, we're called to serve him as our king. It's a privilege, not something that we're to take pride in. See, the danger of pride is that it blinds us to our need of God and our own sinfulness. Whether that be moral self-righteousness or achievement or, or anything else. Instead, we should seek humility. To put it on, as we read in 1 Peter 5, another great passage there, Paul shows, Peter sorry, shows us the better way. He's been writing to Christians who are suffering persecution, as well as to Christian leaders, and he calls for humility instead of pride. In verse 5 he says, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. This is really interesting. When he says, put on or clothe yourselves with humility, it's the word for putting on an apron or wrapping a towel around you like a servant or a slave, just like Jesus did on the night that he washed the disciples' feet before he died and he said, follow my example. Likewise, we are to put on humility. And the reason we do it is because God opposes pride. Because pride is against him. It's pushing him out of the picture, not giving him recognition. But it also, we see here in this verse that God shows favour to the humble, to those who recognise him. He wants to bless us. So we ought to seek humility. And that's what we read in verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand. I really love this image because, yes, it's about submitting to our awesome God, but it's not that he's crushing us under this hand. No, actually, it's this picture of God protecting us as we come and submit to him as the God of our life. His mighty hand will protect us. And that, and then he says, that he may lift you up in due time, just like Jesus and so we put on humility. We submit ourselves under his mighty hand in prayer, he says in verse 7. Cast all your anxieties upon him. Pray to him about everything because he cares for you. See, prayer is one of the best ways we can put on humility. See, in the end, pride just leads to a life, leads to a life of fear. A fear of losing status. So we're clawing, we're chasing after it. It's what we see on, on Facebook and Instagram. It's why they've taken off the number of likes so that people aren't driven by that because they know how despairing it can be. Instead, humility leads to peace and contentment because under God's mighty hand, we actually can be who we really are. We can find our identity in Christ and trust in God. Well, closely related to the sin of pride is selfishness. And let's face it, we were born selfish. No parent ever had to teach a child to be selfish, to, not, to, to steal another kid's toy or not get a tantrum just because they can't get what they want. The thing is, though, as adults, we often just get better at hiding it. But we also live in a society that's all about selfishness. I read a psychology article on selfishness this week and uh, I, I wanted to read this quote from you by a psychologist. He says this, Today most people in Western societies accept the view that people are motivated to pursue their narrow economic and material self-interests. What's good for them? We assume that people support policies consistent with their vested interests, that's laws and government. And this is the, the real kicker. And regard 
behavior that is not self-interested with suspicion. That's our society. And it's so radically different to the, the people of God, the Christian church that we meet in the New Testament. We read in Philippians from before, each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. As Christians, we know selfishness is a sin, and we see it so clearly in others. But I think that's how it becomes such a respectable sin for us, because we're good at justifying it. I mean, just think of a conversation that you've had recently. Who talked the most? And was it you talking about you? Or them talking about them? And, and when you went away, if it was mostly them, did you get all, because it was just about them? No, we're called to follow Christ Jesus. Our attitude, our mindset should be the same as him, the ultimate servant. And that's why in Romans 12, another incredible passage that we had read out to us, as Paul talks about this life of worship, and, and he says that we're actually part of the body of Christ. We're, we're connected with one another. We are belong to each other. And so we are to serve. And then he says in verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Devoted. Honor one another above yourselves. That's not selfishness. Or take 2 Corinthians 5.14 where Paul gives us the motivation for not being selfish. He says, For Christ's love compels us. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. Do you see that? We are to live for Jesus, and his love compels us to love others. And so, really briefly, Let's have a look at three, three ways that we can be selfish. The three T's, I've talked about them before, our, our time, our talents and our treasure. But also, let's be thinking, once we've identified that in ourselves, let's be thinking about how we can be selfless, which is exactly what it says. It's less of ourself. It's, it's picking up, what the, it's all through the New Testament that we are to honour others, put them first. Think less of ourselves and more of others. Because after all, we've been given our time and our talents and our treasure to serve God and others. And so firstly, our time. Let's be selfless. Our time is so precious to us today. The old saying used to be, time is money. Well now, it's money is time. We'll pay people to do things to give us more time to do what we want. And it's part of this society that says my time is more important than yours. Now we go, I don't say that out loud. We say it inside. We say it when we turn up often late for things because whatever I'm doing is more important than you. And this is what we say when we're consistently late to church or to a growth group. We're saying, no, 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 I'm more important than God and his people. Selfishness means we guard our time for us. Being selfless means we're generous with our time. And I think at the moment we've, we've had a significant time with isolation. I hope that you've been calling up uh, other Harbour Church members, family, friends, and, and checking on them, or providing a meal, or sending a message during the week. And I hope that that will continue because that's how we can be selfless with our time. We hear talk about me time. And I think it's healthy for us to have time uh, to, to be right for ourselves, but it's actually so that we can love others. That's the purpose, or should be the purpose, of me time. So that's our time. What about our talents? Um, because of Jesus, we live no longer for me, but to serve him and to love others. And God has given us all the talents that we have to serve him. 
And so here is a question that we need to be asking ourselves. Is God, our family, our church, getting the leftovers of our talents, but instead our job or our hobby or our sport or whatever, is that what's getting our best of our talents? Are we being selfish or selfless? And lastly, our treasure. Because God has been so generous to us in Jesus, we are to be generous to those in need. Uh, this is what we're challenged by in 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. It says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? We are called to love and care and support others both physically and spiritually. Jesus said to us, don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth. It won't last. No, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven by being selfless. That's what Beanie Sunday is all about. It's a great way for us to be selfless with our treasure. So often we think that selfishness is the way to, to hold on to things and, and have more. But what we actually see in the Bible is that selfishness costs. By holding on to our time and our talents and our treasure for us, we end up losing out on the love that we could have shared to others and experienced ourselves. This is what Charles Dickens captures in his character, Mr. Scrooge. You know, the story he's visited that night before Christmas by the ghost of past that shows him what he's missed out on. The ghost of the present that shows him what he's missing out on. And finally, the ghost of the future that shows him how he will not be missed by anyone. It's a good reality check. But what we see here in these passages is that it goes even further. It's not just what we miss out on. Now, as it says in Philippians 2, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Your attitude, your mind should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We're able to be selfless because through Jesus, we have everything that we could ever truly need. Through his death on the cross, his rising to new life and the life that he offers to us. Let's... Turn away from selfishness and be selfless like Jesus. As Christians, it's not all about me. No, life is all about God as we humble ourselves under his mighty hand. And as we live lives full of love, following Jesus, our selfless Saviour and King. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it's going to be a great way for us to respond uh, to God's call today. But let me briefly pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, who instead of being proud, he humbled himself and died on the cross. Instead of being selfish and holding on to all that he had with you, he was selfless and became like us, and died on that cross. And so we pray, by your Spirit, through Jesus, the ultimate example and the one who empowers us, help us to put on humility, and to be selfless. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we've come now to our time to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Shortly before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, he shared a meal with his disciples in which he instructed them to remember his death and resurrection. And I find it helpful to have four different views uh, to have in our mind and our heart as we reflect on the Lord's Supper. And so firstly, <clears throat> as we gather, we look back as we remember uh, Jesus' death on the cross and give thanks to God uh, for him. Secondly, we look up 
as we remember that Jesus rose from the dead, conquering death and rules at God's right hand. Thirdly, we look around because we join in this meal in fellowship in Jesus Christ. Now, normally we'd be able to do that at church. You might be able to do that with people in your home or just have in your heart and mind that the people of Harbour Church and beyond that you have fellowship in Christ with. And lastly, we look ahead. We look forward to the time when Jesus will return and take us to be with him. Paul explains the Lord's Supper to us uh, in 1 Corinthians with these words. He says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so uh, hopefully you've got your bread and juice, and it's just ordinary bread and ordinary juice as symbols uh, for this meal. Paul continues, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man or woman ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. There's two warnings there or reasons not to join in the Lord's Supper. Firstly, if you're not a Christian, uh, that's, that means you haven't recognized or put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then I would say to you, don't join in this meal. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to others or to God. But I would encourage you, get to know Jesus. The other uh, warning is for Christians who have unrepentant sin in their life. Uh, and in a sense, that's not recognizing Jesus as your Savior and Lord of all of your life. But it also could be a way of not recognizing the body is if you're not reconciled or haven't sought to be reconciled with another Christian. And so you're out of fellowship with them and, and that is a strain in your relationship with God. And so there's a really strong urging here to repent, to get rid of that area of sin in your life, to be reconciled. In a moment, we're going to have a time to confess our sins to God. I would urge you, this is the first step to take uh, before joining in the meal. We're called to confess our sins in the letter 1 John, beginning of verse 8. It says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and, will, and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a great promise. And so if you're going to confess your sins to God now, I invite you to join with me in saying this prayer out loud. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have turned against you, ignoring you and rejecting your will for our lives. We have been stubborn and rebellious, but you are merciful and kind. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's hear these words of assurance continuing from 1 John chapter 2. He says, if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen to that. And so to prepare ourselves 
uh, to join in this meal and take the bread and the juice, I'm going to lead us in prayer now. Dear Father, thank you that in your amazing love and tender mercy, you sent your own Son to suffer the punishment for our sins. Thank you that in his death, the just penalty for our sins has been paid, and now we stand forgiven before you. Thank you for raising your Son to life again as the ruler of the world. Enable us to live our lives no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us. Father, we look forward to the return of your Son. While we wait for his return, please strengthen us to live for your glory in all that we do. And now, Father, we thank you for this bread and this wine as we remember your Son's death on our behalf and his victorious resurrection. Amen. Now, with the bread in hand, or the cracker, Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ's body was broken for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. With the cup. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Let us join in saying this prayer of thanks out loud together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights, give light to the world. Keep us in the hope we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. Let's sing our final song together.
What a great song. How great is our God. Um, very different to the message that we hear that it's all about me. Well, it's not, is it? Instead, let's confront the respectable sins that we tolerate of pride and selfishness. Because life is all about God. As we humble ourselves under his mighty hand and as we live life full of love, following Jesus, our selfless Saviour and King. Let's close in prayer. I'm going to be praying uh, not only for us and our service and our time together, but also giving thanks for our gospel partnership at Harbour Church that funds the vision of our church to be a life-changing community for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, fill us by your Spirit with the knowledge of your will so that we can live out humility and selflessness that is worthy of you and pleasing to you. We thank you for the many blessings you have entrusted to us and the generous support of Harbour Church Ministries that comes from Christ's giving of himself to us. And so make us a life-changing community for Christ in our homes and gatherings, to our neighbours and to the nations, to grow your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.